uh, some of the areas where we can save money is um, in out-of-state travel. Uh, technology is here. You know, my sister lives in Africa right now, uh, and, and she's living there for a year. I can't go over there every week to talk to her, but I can talk to her every day for free on Skype. We have internet, we have webcams, we have web conferencing. We don't have to travel all over the U.S. as uh, state employees to find information. There are going to be important times where the Commissioner of Finance should go out to Washington, D.C. to see what's going on with federal stimulus dollars. But a lot of times they can pick up the phone, they can log into the, their computer. We can save millions of dollars by freezing out-of-state travel. And in the House of Representatives, we walk the walk. We have banned it. We have banned it since the steps had started, and no state legislator on your dime has traveled outside the state of Minnesota. Number two is in the area of out-of-state contracts. Uh, the state of Minnesota contracts for a lot of business, as it should. It's almost $2 billion of, of state contracts where we contract with outside businesses. I'd like to see us make sure that Minnesota companies get preferential treatment for that, because if we're using our taxpayer dollars, it should, should be going to Minnesota businesses. And if, and if there are state employees who are already paying that could do the job, we shouldn't have contracts for it, because now we're just paying employees to sit there and watch contracted people do the work. <laughs> And as I said before, that's almost $2 billion our, as of our state budget. We should review it because I'd rather have a taxpayer dollar spent in Minnesota than in Delaware or Florida or Alabama or another state. Just makes sense to me. And the third place I would look at is kind of the middle man management bureaucracy. And this happens with every governor that's been elected. You know, we had a governor from northern Minnesota, Rudy Perpich, uh, who, who did this. Uh, governor Plenty does it as well. And, and I'm not knocking them for doing it. I'm saying that. It's about priorities now. And when we have to cut 1.2 or 5 or $8 billion, we should look at political appointees before we look at nurses or funding for our schools, and we should cut there first. And actually, under Governor Pawlenty, the number of political appointees rose in his time in office, rose from where they were at under Ventura. So this isn't a knock on the people who have those jobs. A lot of them are good people. They've been around in government or in elections for a long time. But I'm just saying, when we're going to have to cut billions and billions of dollars, they should be the first to go before funding for schools and nursing homes and adults with developmental disabilities. Will, will your proposal include a tax increase this year, do you believe? That's hard to say right now. I, we're going we're gonna to start by trying to solve. I mean, we're going to take the governor at his word <coughs> and others who have said that we can solve this with cuts alone. And I think it's a better way to do this instead of first starting warring, saying, here's our, here's our most partisan ideas, here's your most partisan ideas, philosophically, let's have at it. Let's start the other way and say, where can we agree? Can we at least agree that more people can pick up a phone and do web conferencing and, and do out-of-state travel? That's a few million dollars. Let's start adding it up. It, Kurt's idea with uh, the, dairy, the dairy idea from Wisconsin, let's throw that in the mix. A few hundred thousand dollars, great. Let's add it up instead of being confrontational right away. And I'm going to walk in the governor's office with Kurt later today and propose that that's what we do. See how close we can get to 1.2. If we can get to 1.2, great, because the deficit's going to be much bigger next year, and any work we can do to cut the budget this year would be helpful. Kurt, what would you like to see in the budget? Well, and or and not see, <laughs> yeah. I guess. <laughs> well, and and uh, I, I was watching the news lately too, and uh, it, Representative Sertich had a press conference with some uh, MAPE employees, those are the public employees with the union, and uh, one of the ways, and it was this was just for the 2010-2011 uh, contract settlement, is 1.94 uh, billion dollars. It's a two percent increase in the empl public employees' wages. Now, well, when Ma we're Ma talking, may had, had a zero. They, fro they had a frozen increase. Just so you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was zero. <laughs> what I'm saying was, as you've been laying off employees, we've been seeing government employees getting some significant increases. Not to say the work that they're not doing. I've been a public employee, both state and federal. I've also been a private sector employee. I went for five years at one of my jobs without a pay increase because it was tough economic times. And as far as the, the ability to find that, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's kind of an easy deal to go after and say, well, we just have never liked Carol Molnow anyway. Let's go and kick her in the shins. Let's take Sherry Yecky. Let's take, and quite honestly, the reason, it's, actually, it's Tony's fault. We had all these elections that we lost. We had people that needed jobs. And <laughs> when I got there. I'll agree with, I'll agree with him there. <laughs> we had 82 members when I got there. We have 47. That's a lot of people out of work. But quite honestly, when we're, when we're talking about, and I, I'm not advocating that we start uh, firing government employees because that's one of the other political jabs that come into your back. I'm saying that if we're all going to be in this together, as you as business owners are having to ask your employees 
And it's not the, uh, the college kid that just started. It's not the, you know, the new associate. These are people who built your businesses with you, started with you 10, 15, 20 years ago, that you're now having to go and say, I'm sorry, I, I can't keep you on anymore, or I'm going to have to ask you to take a pay cut. And I, if it's two years, if it's four years, if it's six years, uh, I don't think it's anything too much to ask of our state employees to be held at least flat. I, I would say, that, and there's a few of them that have come to me and said, thank you, just keep us flat. I don't want to be the one out there getting a six or eight thousand dollar raise when my spouse is at home and has took a twenty thousand or twenty percent hit in their pay and lost twenty thousand dollars. It's that kind of if it's a shared sacrifice that are, are my friends on the other side of the aisle talk about quite often that shared sacrifice. Where is it? If it works, have have a settlement going into the future, and that future budget deficit that's uh, been being you know, kind of bambied about quite quite honestly a little bit too aggressively. That's if we go back to the spending levels of where we were. So that's like saying your sales for 06 were really great. Next year, I'm just going to assume that my sales for 06 are going to be back in, in 2010. Well, we're going to have to readjust the budget. And one thing we heard about a lot last year, but haven't heard so much lately, is a zero-based budgeting. So you look at what you have coming in, you spend what you have coming in. The governor's got an idea for that for constitutional amendment. Uh, again, <laughs> there's 87 of them in the House, 47 of us. I don't think there's a good chance the governor's bill will pass, but each day hope springs eternal. But if it's a matter of, of where we're going to go in the future, we're going to have to look. This economy, this recession, isn't going to bounce back like the past. The state economist has said the 3 and 4% growth that we had seen after past recessions is going to be maybe 1%. So we can't go back to the days of 2006 or 2008 spending levels and say, this is what we expect to spend, so we've got this huge deficit. We're going to have to figure it out. We're going to have to readjust back. We're back in 06 and 05 numbers. The budget has to go back there as well, because we can't come back to you and say, give us more money, go produce more, charge your customers more, because they don't have the money to pay either. Um, I want to ask a political question. I'm hoping for something other than a pat response. <laughs> um, because we've given you a lot of those. No, yeah. these have been, no, not, no, but this one I've asked before, and I often get a pat response. Um, so election years are always tough. They're always tough. There's always little political maneuvering going on. I think we have five or six individuals in the legislature running for governor. Um, and so, and everybody's up for re-election. Um, and that changes the dynamics. It, it could, you know, I'm, I'm interested, Kurt, in what you think, you know, th there was that stronghold of the House Republicans who really prevented that override of the GAMC, uh, single uh, line item veto, which, which, which I think really was difficult for people. You know, is, is that as strong? What, what happens when you have, you know, um, uh, the speaker um, who's running for governor. That's going to create some interesting dynamics. So can you speak a little bit about how this may be even more challenging? You want to start? Oh, sure. Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, my name is Kurt Zellers. I'm not running for governor. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, honestly, uh, it'll probably mean Tony and I have to speak a lot less on the House floor because uh, we're going to have, uh, <laughs> besides, uh, you know, Speaker Kelleher, uh, Representative Thiessen is also running and uh, chairs one of the big health care committees. So, I think the dynamic uh, is going to be, we've seen it before uh, when Phil Krinke and uh, um, Chuck Knobloch were running for, or Chuck Knobloch, sorry. <laughs> Boy, anybody that knows Jim Knobloch, that's a Freudian slip. <laughs> and Michelle Bachman, that year. Yeah, well. yeah and, and Congresswoman Bachman. So uh, we've seen it before. I, I think it's going to have a little bit of play in there, but uh, quite honestly, if you thought that Tom Emmer and Marty Seifert weren't going to give floor speeches uh, any more or less floor speeches than last year, <laughs> Uh, you'd be kind of <laughs> you'd be naive at the Capitol, but I think it'll maybe play a little bit in there. But uh, since it's not a budget year, uh, it's a bonding year, technically what we always could, you know, typify it as. Uh, I don't think it will be maybe uh, that pronounced. But uh, I do think, uh, from a standpoint of leadership styles, uh, you know, Marty Seifert, and thank him for doing it because otherwise I wouldn't have this job. Marty resigned uh, so that he wouldn't have to kind of balance. You know, who are you helping the caucus or? The, uh, the you know your gubernatorial campaign so I actually you know appreciate that that we don't have to deal with that but I think it's going to be a lot of what we've seen in the past uh, I think they'll offer some different solutions they'll probably have some more five and eight point plans <laughs> everybody's going to have eight point plans and five point plans that they'll offer but I think the philosophies and the, where they voted isn't going to ch won't change any from last year. <laughs> 